in this part of the uh, of the session, we are going to have two two uh, two parts. One, I'm going to pose some uh, lead questions to our panelists, uh, who will then uh, respond uh, briefly, uh, and then after with that, we we, we we do that. Then we'll turn to the audience and we'll open the conversation uh, to you members uh, of the audience. And so I'm going to start. Uh, with uh, His Excellency, uh, former President William Mukapa, which in your key note presentation, you have emphasized uh, the point that member states are key instruments of building and taking the lead uh, in building in, uh, integration, just as uh, they did during the, what you called the cooperation phase uh, when we were fighting for independence in the region. So what do you see as a strategic role that member states can play in achieving these objectives of deeper integration, uh, but at the same time also maximizing networks, uh, maximizing and taking advantage of new technologies, addressing the issues of the youth, as you very well uh, uh, put it out in your address just a short while ago. Please, Mr. President. You see, the liberation struggle was a simple agenda. And it, it was embraced by all the leaders very passionately indeed. It's difficult to translate that passion into attachment to the economic cause. Uh, the perception that there is a common enemy facing us is very different now than it was at the time. Mm. So the challenge now is how to conscientize ourselves that we are still under oppression. We are still under oppression. Because even the natural resource base of our country is still owned, practically that is, by our former colonizers and new nations, which we've got to know. But if we were to understand that this is the key to the success in the future, uh, the ownership of those resource base and their translation into transformative factors for, of, of, our, of our people's lives, and that I hope would bring would bring our countries together, not as fervently as it was during the liberation struggle, but much more than it is manifest now. At the national level, there are certain achievements can be perceived as, as applying to all the members of the SADC, about the role of the youth, the role of the women, and so on. To resolve to put aside resources on an annual basis, after agreeing on a program on those issues is the challenge. And for that, you need leadership from the top. Just as getting contributions in order to enable the liberation movements to fight. Similarly now, we must educate our people about this new fight and mobilize the resource base. Even if it's a token allocation on an annual basis to promoting the programs and translating them into projects rather than programs. That is the challenge that I see just now, in, in my view. But, you know, I've been out of office for 14 years, so. So although I am retired, I'm not all that tired. I read and I follow things. I think that is really the key. We want, we want a, a real passionate recognition of of the designs of the developed countries to own our resource, resource base, to turn our markets into their markets, and to resist the effort of establishing our own markets and our own base, and to recognize that that base is strengthened by integration, not just cooperation. That, I think, is the challenge. What would I have done? Please, I am 14 years older than I was at that time. 
uh, I am very, I am particularly keen about the youth, not so much the women. The women are dependable because they understand what oppression is about. But the, 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 the youth have not lived through the liberation struggle. They have not received enough indoctrination, if you like, of the present, <laughs> of the present situation. And those must be very readily addressed, very readily addressed, so that they can really carry the baton forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Excellency uh, Dr. Sima Makoni, uh, as former executive secretary of SADC for 10 years, uh, what would you identify as your successes during that time? But also, what were the difficulties uh, during those 10 years uh, of your leadership? Uh, and, and also, in your opinion, uh, where do you see SADC uh, going in the next 10, 20 years? Thank you, Ndugu Moderator, President Mkapa, distinguished colleagues, let me take half a minute to thank the Ongozi Institute, SADC Secretariat, University of Dar es Salaam, for affording me the opportunity to come back home. I was last here <laughs> 10 years ago. I arrived at 1 a.m. this morning, and in the 10 years that I have been, been here, I've heard stories about Tanzania's progress, but even in the dark of night, I could see things I didn't see 10 years ago. But allow me, before responding directly to your questions, to share a few reflections. Firstly, the link between SADC the conference and SADC the community. The Lusaka Declaration was offered by heads of states and government to the peoples of Southern Africa. And the Vinduk Declaration was also offered to the people of Southern Africa. The cause of our efforts and the ultimate purpose of our effort are the people, the peoples of our region. If in nearly 40 years our efforts are not yet touching the everyday lives of our people, then we have a lot of work on our hands. In 1990, we did a documentary to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the founding of SADC. And part of the documentary involved talking to so-called ordinary people. And I ran very quickly a conversation between the documentalist and a lady at the Makeni Market in Lusaka in Zambia. It went like this. Madam, do you know SADC? Yes. What do you think about it? It's very important. Why do you say that? Because my president goes there every year. <laughs> Are we any different today? If we went into the streets of Dar es Salaam and asked people who are going about their daily chores, would we get a different answer from that answer in 1990? If yes, congratulations. If not, then we know we have a lot of work to do. The second reflection I'd like to share is around integration as contrasted to coordination. SADC, the conference, was about coordinating common efforts. SADC, the community, is about integration. And President Mukapa touched on this theme quite strongly in his presentation. In 1988, we used to offer themes of our work every one or two years. In 1988, we launched the theme of investment in production. And the focus was to work to establish productive capacities in our economies. 
And President Kaunda addressing the SADC summit around this theme says, our problem is we consume what we don't produce. And we produce and we produce what we don't consume. We consume what we don't produce and we produce what we don't consume. 40 years down the road, as individual countries and as a region, are we any different? That also defines our current challenge. The third reflection I would like to share is about equity and balance. A dominant theme of both the Lusaka Declaration and the Vinduk Treaty. Because our countries are so disparate, Tanzania is so much bigger than Lesotho. Zimbabwe at that time was so much more developed than Botswana. Today, South Africa is that much bigger by volume, population, size of economy compared to Malawi. To achieve equity and balance, have we got instruments, capacities, and resources for the region to develop together in equity and balance to mitigate the disparities among us? Those were the questions we confronted in 1980 at the formation of the organization are they questions we still confront today, 40 years down the road? If I follow President Mukapa's presentation this morning, he suggests we're still confronting those issues. But to your question, sir, I was privileged to serve SADC through three phases. So we went through establishment, first five years to get the organization running, a modest secretariat of 13 people and a much bigger number of people operating in SADC in the member states because we operated under the decentralized sectoral coordination structure. After establishment, we consolidated the coordination activities that we were pursuing at the time, mainly transport and communications, energy, agriculture, and food security. And then we went through the third phase of transformation from the coordination conference to the community. In fact, bringing out the Vinduk Treaty and its approval in 1992 was among the last activities that I executed as Executive Secretary of SADC. Whether they are achievements or not, I leave for you to decide. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Maconi. Uh, Professor New Newkirk, uh, in his address, former President Mukapa emphasized, made it very clear uh, that a SADC stands out among the regional blocks in Africa for having been very successful uh, in ensuring peace and security and addressing uh, the crisis that did arise uh, you know, from one country or the other. So in your own opinion, uh, what are the major challenges or the key issues that needs to be addressed in order to consolidate and strengthen our peace and security in the region. Uh, thanks, facilitator, for the uh, for the question. Um, and let me start off by thanking the organizers, Ungozi Institute and the SADC Secretariat, uh, for the invitation uh, and the warm hospitality in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So, so it's true that that the keynote speaker said that in terms of peace and security, SADC is a success story. I can hardly disagree with him because he's sitting right next to me. <laughs> so I find myself in a pickle, but allow me, as a professor should do, to interrogate uh, that statement and see what we, can, uh, what we can learn. 
And so, indeed, it is true that the AU and SADC has developed over time very sophisticated policy frameworks and strategies uh, to deal with um, democracy promotion and threats to security. And indeed, SADC enjoys relative peace relative to the rest of the continent. But peace must surely be more than the absence of war. Positive peace must include justice for all. And so, are these policy instruments robust enough to ensure positive peace for, is it, 230 million citizens of SADC? Consider the contours of our volatile world. This is what we're up against. Let me start globally, on the global scale. Uh, as you know, we, we observe seismic shocks with damaging consequences. The first one I think of is economic vulnerabilities. And the major trend that I see is the globalization of the world economy and growing political nationalism, which you spoke about, uh, President. So we have a slowdown in global economic growth, a rise in global debt, and rising inequality between and within countries. Under this rubric, we also see rising major power tensions. And as a consequence, multilateralism is weakening, which impacts negatively on democracy and conflict management and resolution. Secondly, I see environmental risks where the major trend is, to put it simply, extreme weather and the failure of climate change, mitigation, and adaptation. One result is acute food insecurity. Another um, result is the struggle or the challenge to manage natural disasters. And you will recall the cyclone Idai that hit Mozambique and parts of Zimbabwe and Malawi a few months ago. A real challenge to our capability to respond. The third one is technological instability, where the trend is new instabilities that are being caused by the deepening integration of digital technologies with every aspect of life. And the simple example to use from where I sit in Johannesburg, I have a smartphone, you have one too. I do my banking on a smartphone app. I don't go to the branch. As a consequence in my country, hundreds of people are being laid off now in the financial sector. They've become redundant. The teller is no longer needed. So the impact of the 4IR is upon us. We have to mitigate and adapt. I see two other consequences of technological instability. The first one is the vulnerability of critical technological infrastructure, which is a growing national security concern. So we face cyber threats increasingly. And the second one is artificial intelligence, AI, enables the rise of media echo chambers and fake news. And in conclusion, I want to recommend some additional measures. First, I've got four. I've got five. First, review the SADC peace and security architecture in the light of these identified trends. There's a process underway. And I think they need to take into account those most recent, over the horizon, emerging threats to our sovereignty, to our well-being. Secondly, pay particular attention to the capacity of our member states to anticipate and respond individually and collectively to these challenges. This requires, in my view, a regional, homegrown, 
Security Sector Review Program supported by the Secretariat. The third one, rather than relying on external consultants, draw on indigenous African expertise in peace and security. This is an underrated of, or under-evaluated, undervalued relationship that uh, we can improve on. My fourth recommendation is for SADC is create a research unit or a policy analysis unit in the Secretariat, perhaps at senior level, where its purpose will be to facilitate the generation and the dissemination of new knowledge. And then finally, allow me to say, facilitator, national and regional security must promote the interests of our people. It's as simple as that. If our plans do not address poverty alleviation, inequality and exclusion, SADC will fail. The challenge is clear. SADC needs a social compact with the people of the region to journey, to continue the journey towards the ultimate goal, which is freedom from want and freedom from fear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, Mr. Terry, the keynote speaker did highlight uh, the role of the private sector uh, and address the issues of partnerships uh, with governments and other uh, players uh, to make the mission and vision of SADEC possible. So what, what do you think are the constraints that the private sector faces uh, in enhancing and deepening its role uh, in building this integration? And what can, the, what can SADEC and the member states do to enable the private sector to fulfill its integration role? Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Um, maybe before going into that, I'd like to um, appreciate a very uh, powerful and very informative uh, lecture by uh, Your Excellency President Mkapa, and as well as uh, my sincere appreciation to the organizers of Ungozi Institute, uh, the SADC Secretariat in the University of Dar es Salaam. And thank you very much for putting me on the spot, uh, because you have um, put me in a stage with everyone who has dedicated their lives and career to the development in SADC. Then you invented, uh, invited someone who was not even born when SADC was uh, <laughs> operational. Um, but four key points. I think the key pain points for the private sector are infrastructure, uh, skills, and uh, uh, to a large extent, the issue of quality employment. You have an issue of finance, which is caused by savings. And the last bit that I'll talk about is uh, fairness. Uh, and, and infrastructure, I'll just give you one particular example. It costs around $4,000 to transport uh, one container of tobacco from Malawi to the port of Nakala by road. But if you, if you have a very functioning railway within the same distance, you'd transport the same container for around um, you know, $1,800, $2,000, which is 50% uh, uh, sort of cheaper compared to the current uh, level of infrastructure. And my point is that uh, within the SADC community, we have somewhere around 50 to 30% disadvantage in terms of competitiveness uh, to our products just because we don't have uh, enough infrastructures uh, going around within the space. It is estimated that within the African region, we have infrastructure gap within the SADC region of somewhere around 450 to 500 billion US dollars. So as rightly as President Mkapa mentioned, uh, we have a constraint of resources and we have to really think uh, of our country on how best uh, we can invest in infrastructure because at the end of the day, the infrastructures open up of opportunities for our product to be co uh, competitive within the market. Uh, the second bit uh, that I would like to talk about is skills. I mean, education, having a very 
um, uh, quality skilled labor force within the SADC region. Uh, the high quality labor force is estimated to be somewhere between 3 and 5 percent. So we still have a lot to do with the education system and our training to provide opportunities um, that are opening up with the development of the private sector. And the third area is uh, what I mentioned as savings. At the moment, the large amount of capital going to private sector is coming from FDIs, which means we source um, our resources from a different part of the world to bring it into our own region and then lend it to our businesses. We don't have enough going around in terms of saving mechanisms to help us uh, have enough resources within our country to give to businesses to do business with it. Um, and that means uh, our countries and our region needs to look at areas um, which can spur not only domestic savings but also formalization. And my last point is the issue of fairness and I think this has been touched in bits and pieces uh, by presentations from everyone and I think it's important to underscore it. And for the sake of um, uh, sort of diplomacy, I will sort of draw similarities with the issue of German within the AU compared to South Africa within the SADC region. And not to say that we should prosecute our brothers for making headway, but I think that there is an important dialogue to be held with respect to fairness of econo economies uh, as well as the private sector within the region in a way that encourages everyone to join uh, into, um, uh, into the opportunity that the SADC region uh, uh, provides. So German accounts for around 30% uh, of the GDP of the European Union. It's the top trading partner for 18 of the 20 European nations that are part of the Eurozone. They lead in everything, I mean, not only in manufacturing, in terms of productivity, in terms of exports outside the EU and trade within the EU. And in some ways, uh, the European Commission has a role to see how you can regulate and provide opportunities to other countries that are much smaller and have a different economic structure compared to what uh, the dominant player um, uh, has within that particular block. And this is a homework for us within the SADC region on how we encourage other member states uh, through not only fiscal policies but also monetary policies and other initiatives to make sure that we bring them into the board for them to enjoy the, um, the, um, the benefits that the SADC region would provide. So in the ballpark, I see a very positive future for the private sector within the region. A lot of um, uh, opportunities with respect to infrastructures opening up, and I think that we're heading into a bright future with respect to private sector participation in the region. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we are going to end this session as we started it uh, by calling on uh, former President Kappa to address this, this question, which is, as we all know, uh, in 1964, in Cairo, there was uh, what you, people have described as a big clash between two giants, giant leaders of Africa. That is the late Kwame Nkrumah, then president of Ghana, and President Julius Kambaragi Nyerere of Tanzania, uh, on the modality of integration, whether it should be and Africa must unite now, uh, as called for by Kwame Nkrumah, or it should take a gradual approach, uh, as was called for by Mwadim Nyerere. And uh, 50 years on, I want to ask uh, former President Mkapa, with the insight, uh, was regional integration this gradual approach? Was this the correct uh, approach to African unity? Could we have moved faster? Uh, with the other approach, as called for by Nkrumah. President Mkapa, please. Mr. Moderator, you are determined to crucify me. <laughs> I think, I think Mwalimu was right. Mwalimu was right because The degree of realizing the imperative of uniting at once was not there. Actually, it might have driven us further apart. Now, what happens after so many countries have got their liberation? We started the Organization of African Unity. We thought we would strengthen it by telling, telling, tell, changing the title from Organization of African Unity 
African Union. And that for me is the real problem. Uh, we believe that exhortations are a substitute for concrete programs and their implementation and their review. We have underbrated, for instance, underbrated um, the, the peer review mechanism. It is supposed to help good governance within the African Union. We send missions, they present their reports, but no concrete programs of reform or implementation ensue. I can't think of any, well, I don't know, Ambassador Sefue may have known, but not in my time anyway. The, the result is that we are very good at formulating imperatives, but actuals, what to do, when to do it, who should do it, and how they are going to be funded, who is going to review the work, who is going to put even greater energy, how often should we meet to review this, that kind of activity is lacking. And that is why we have one summit after another, and in fact we have, we have exacerbated the inactivity by increasing the activity of meeting. You have two summits a year instead of one. So the other point is, we think that by structuring our efforts along the lines of the developed countries, such as the European Union and so on, we think that once we have those structures around, we have made progress. Structures are not a substitute for practical results. I think it is <laughs> Simba, I think, who said that uh, we must realize that we are, these, these countries are different, both in the endowment of natural resources, in the history of their liberation, in the size of their populations, and so on. Meeting to take cognizance of that and evolve a common vision and a, a common program of implementation, a timeline, is, is not happening. It's not happening. And I believe that is the, the biggest challenge. And it will be a challenge even for SADC. I happened to be press secretary to President Nyerere when he was leading the Southern African Development uh, Liberation Struggle. He and his colleagues were the frontline states. If there was a major development adverse to the liberation struggle, or to the liberation wars, he would call a meeting of his colleagues and his colleagues would leave everything, put everything aside and come to meet within 24 hours. That is the kind of seriousness, the kind of passion, the kind of commitment that can produce results which will be noticeable and mobilize the population to be behind your development endeavors. That is something we must strive for. But otherwise, as I said, our people will see us as the political elites who meet very regularly, praise one another, issue documents, and say, sir, that's all. I'm sorry, I am being very blunt, but that's the way I see it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>